Hello, this is Dr. Max Fung, and if all is going according to plan, it's May 19th, 2022, 7 a.m. Eastern, 4 a.m. Pacific. I'd like to thank Dr. Emma Gutman, Professor and Chair of Mount Sinai Dermatology, for this kind invitation. I do not have any relevant disclosures for this presentation. Since inception in 2003, our DermPath unit has grown from a total of two to four and now nearly 20 full-time employees. And in the lower right is our 16-headed teaching microscope, and each of the faculty have two-headed microscopes in their offices. Our dermatopathology service is a unit within the Department of Dermatology with its own independent dermatopathology laboratory. But all of the skills and training that allowed me to be willing and able to put in the sweat equity to build a derm path service from scratch didn't just appear out of thin air. It started with medical training and New York City figures largely in that respect. This was my fellowship year with Dr. Scott McNutt and John Reed at the annual fellows lunch with my co-fellow, Dr. Mary Parisi of New York. And of course, one of the great things about training in a large program is meeting the many other trainees, including Dr. Arumi Uriya from Barcelona and Dr. Samira Hussein, who preceded me by one year and is still actively practicing academic dermatopathology at Columbia. Shortly before Dr. Magnut's retirement, he was fated at his Fest Sprach, hosted by one of his more renowned trainees, Dr. Bruce Smoller, who's then at Little Rock, now Professor and Chair of Pathology at the University of Rochester. Dr. Mark Lebwall graced UC Davis with his presence as the 2016 Novi guest lecturer, and I was privileged to have a chance to meet with him individually, and he was very interested to talk to me about our dermatopathology service, as was Dr. Gutman, who I met several years later, albeit only by Zoom and Facebook. 2019 was the last in-person year for an American Society of Dermatopathology meeting. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Robert Phelps with a couple of his trainees. And this last image on the lower right symbolizes for me the end, but also hopefully the beginning of a new chapter of my experiences in New York. This was the last time I saw Dr. McNutt before he passed away last year, shown here with his wife and another one of his illustrious trainees, Dr. Chris Shea and his wife, Dr. Shea being an endowed professor of dermatology at the University of Chicago and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cutaneous Pathology. So today I'll be focusing on histopathologic clues for diagnosis. And again, I have to thank Dr. Gutman for giving me guidance in selecting the topic. She was interested in having me focus on dermpath pearls. And so truth be told, Dr. McNutt is not the person who would have taught me any of these things. He was much more interested in avant-garde things of the time, such as novel immunohistochemistry and electron microscopy. But the other half of my brain was formed in dermatology residency at UCSF by attendings who trained under the Ackerman School. So I have kind of both sides. And so today's session is meant to be more practical. And so these are so-called free ancillary tests. They don't cost anything. They're just things that you look for. And so we'll go through each of these in turn. I'll then touch on another free test, the so-called no eosinophils rule. And so actually it turns out most of this talk probably can be renamed efficiency derm path. But either way, as I get more advanced in my years of practice, I can't help but feel sometimes more like a dinosaur. And considering the lifespan of the dinosaurs now extinct relative to the lifespan of humans not yet extinct. I wonder, is DermPath heading the way of the dinosaurs? So we have H&E Dermatopathology, which has been around for a century and a half, and much more recently, the advent of immunohistochemistry, PCR. And so what's happening? We have no shortage of investment into artificial intelligence threatening to render dermatopathologists extinct. 
and experts in the field like Dr. Philip Lebois, the man who first introduced me to dermatopathology as a medical student, acknowledging that molecular studies may well replace H&E in a matter of a few decades. And so while it may be that this talk will be dedicated to the old school of hematoxylin and eosin, or just an oldster like me, I would submit that the curve of H&E dermatopathology, the lifespan, is fairly flat. It's not yet reaching extinction. So we've had enhancements and improvements with the newer molecular techniques, but the vast majority of daily diagnoses are still made by the tried and true centuries and a half old technique, very cost-effective H&E. And by the way, I think all the serious scientists are probably at the SID meeting in Portland this week anyway, right? And so I'll be focusing this session on free histologic clues at the level of H&E that may facilitate diagnosis. And I think this can be helpful both for pathologists, but also for the clinicians who are managing the patients, because you don't need to be able to recognize this sign. You just need to know to ask for it. And then at the end, I'd like to touch on the dermal hypersensitivity reaction, which is, in, in my mind, a deficiency in dermatology, at least in the published literature. So here is the first sign, and if one knows about the sign and knows how to recognize it, one knows the diagnosis. And any suspicions from the panoramic view can hopefully be confirmed at higher magnification. And a little clinical pathologic correlation never hurts, but we know that in reality we're not always able to do this. And so the clue in this case is the presence of caterpillar bodies within the epidermal blister roof and the diagnosis porphyria, specifically porphyria cutanea tarda. Now the caterpillar bodies are kind of sandwiched in the middle of the epidermal blister roof and they contain both apoptotic keratinocytes and basement membrane material and as such are highlighted by periodic PAS or PASD stains, just like basement membrane of the dermal epidermal junction and underlying blood vessels. Now, before we get too far into the weeds, it will be important to maintain some perspective. Most of this talk is going to be focusing on single specific clues that are always, even though I won't always mention it, one of many clues that form the composite assessment of a histopathologic interpretation. So remember, for porphyria cutanea tarda, we expect a cell-poor subepidermal blister. Typically, there will be preserved dermal papillae, which is referred to frequently as festooning, and thickened, hyalinized blood vessels in the upper dermis that sometimes are highlighted by direct immunofluorescence analysis, most commonly IgG. Although in my anecdotal experience, I hardly ever see positive DIF specimens for porphyria. And I think we all know that not every example of a disease fully reads the textbook, if you will. So here we have a subepidermal blister, but we're not seeing the classic festooning that all the textbooks talk about in PCT. And we can see that the basement membrane of the blood vessels underlying the blister are not overtly thickened. By the way, that was a Microsoft rendering of a caterpillar. So with all due respect to the caterpillars, they are indeed quite a diverse group. I think I prefer this one for its somewhat cellular segmented profile. So back to the panoramic view. Again, we have a subepidermal blister with minimal inflammation present on acral skin with solar elastosis. There's a lot of distracting hemorrhage there, but again, note the absence of festooning in the blister floor. And then now that our attention has been drawn to the caterpillar bodies, we can see these various segments, usually fairly precisely in the mid portion of the epidermal blister. Note that in some areas, the cells appear to be in somewhat of a flattened or caterpillar shape, but we see cells with pale cytoplasm. We do not see the eosinophilic basement membrane material like might be more evident in other foci over here towards the left of the blister. A PAS or PASD stain can help confirm the presence of basement membrane material within these structures. 
But I think in the most classic examples, the presence of the basement me membrane material can be accurately predicted on H and E, even though it might look prettier on the PAS stain. And with poorly developed or perhaps cross-sectioned caterpillar bodies, it may not be quite as clear on H and E. So for example, here on the left, we have a nucleus and possibly some basement membrane material, whereas here we have, looks more like just a straight up pycnotic nucleus of a dyskeratotic keratinocyte. So the PASD or PAS stain can help confirm the presence of basement membrane material. I first learned about the caterpillar bodies when I was a dermatology resident from one of my attendings, Dr. Barbara Egbert, who worked at both Stanford and UCSF. And this was an original reprint that she gave me back in the day. Although the original description was credited to one of her pathology colleagues at Stanford, Dr. Alvin Cox. And it was later Dr. Mays and colleagues in South Carolina that looked at the caterpillar bodies ultra structurally and documented the presence of both basement membrane material and degenerating keratinocytes. But to claim that caterpillar bodies are 100% diagnostically specific or pathognomonic for porphyria, that's a little bit uh, hard to believe, isn't it? So how about this case? This one looks at first glance, pretty much the same as the previous one that I showed you. It's a cell-poor subepidermal split. It does lack the festooning. Of note, it's not from acral skin. We have a basket weave stratum corneum, so that's one clue. Another clue, lack of severe solar elastosis. And a third clue, clusters of small, slightly thick-walled blood vessels in the upper dermis, evidence of venous stasis. So this was an unusual case, but was interpreted to be a venous stasis blister or edema blister with clusters of keratinocytes in the mid portion of the epidermal blister roof. And albeit only minimal staining on PAS. In the series on caterpillar bodies by my colleagues and I at the University of Connecticut, we additionally recognized a potential pitfall or way in which caterpillar bodies might be overcalled, and we coined this the caterpillar body-like cluster or CB-like cluster. We would see these kind of sandwiched keratinocytes with pale cytoplasm, but they would not contain the basement membrane material, and they seem to be associated with a broader range of clinical pathologic diagnoses. But some of the examples of the CB-like clusters were in fact from cases of confirmed porphyria cutanea tarda. And the breakdown of the data from our series is summarized here in this table. So we looked at PCT, but also a variety of other disorders. And here are the caterpillar bodies. So we saw them in nearly half of the 14 cases of PCT. And then we have this one, arguably an outlier case of the edema blister with the caterpillar body. But then if we have the looser definition of just kind of caterpillar body-like clusters without basement membrane, basement membrane material, we see that the specificity is decreased and we can see these structures in a variety of other disorders, including seven cases of bull's pemphigoid. And of note, festooning certainly is most characteristic of PCT, but it is not that infrequently seen in bull's pemphigoid, which is much more commonly encountered. Back in 2004, there were no smartphones, there was no social media, so the way that one's work could be recognized, uh, at least as trendy, uh, a feature of the moment, would be, for example, to have Dr. Bruce Thiers recognized your work in Elsevier's Yearbook of Dermatology. And for me, this project serves as a memento of my wonderful years on the junior faculty at the University of Connecticut. And looking at the slide, it also, I think, is a pretty good, pretty good example of how one can be efficient with publications. At least this is probably the epitome of efficiency for me. So for the students and the trainees, you can see here that the 
study was first presented as a poster at the annual SID meeting in Century City. And it turns out there, my future boss, Fu Tong Lu, interviewed me for the job that I now have at UC Davis. And then we had the formal publication after that. And this QR code will take you to that article if interested. And once again, the inspiration for this study goes back to one of my own attendings, Dr. Barbara Egbert, who was serving as a dermatopathologist both at UC San Francisco and Stanford at the time. Okay, so let's go on to the next free ancillary diagnostic test. This structure shown here is pathognomotic for, you fill in the blank. Clinical correlation can be quite helpful. The spade sign is a pathognomonic histopathologic feature of acne keloidalis. Defined originally by colleagues in Taiwan as a dilated, thinned, spade-shaped follicular epithelium centered in the mid-isthmic portion of the hair follicle. Characterized by keratinocytes with pale eosinophilic cytoplasm and abrupt or trichelemal keratinization with relatively compact and eosinophilic keratin, at least compared to an epidermal inclusion cyst. And again, higher magnification with the pale keratinocytes and abrupt or trichelemal keratinization best demonstrated in the inferior portion. Here's an example that's admittedly a, a bit more marginal. We do have the characteristic pale keratinocytes, but we do have arguably a predominance of the epidermal inclusion cyst type content with the trichelemal component only focally present. I first learned about the spade sign from dermatology and dermatopathology colleagues in Taiwan at the 2019 Taiwanese Derm Association annual meeting, just a few months before the pandemic hit. And they presented a case and I immediately knew that I needed to look at some of our own cases. But uh, this was Chao Kai Shu and Julia Lee, co-authors on the original paper describing the spade sign in acne keloidalis in an Asian population. Depicted here is one of the examples of the spade sign from the original series by Cheng et al, as well as their table reviewing the different stages with the spade sign being typical of the subacute stage of acne keloidalis. In that study, Cheng and colleagues additionally described a variant of the spade sign they termed the balloon sign. So the exact same criteria, but more circular or balloon shaped rather than spade shaped, but again, located in the deep dermis. Shown here below the level of some eccrine glands. And again, pale keratinocytes and mostly eosinophilic, relatively compact content. But I think it stands to reason that for any feature held to be specific, there are going to be one or more fake outs of the feature. So with the spade sign, we know that there can be all manner of follicular plugging. So the definition was intentionally strict to try to maintain the specificity of it. So here's an example of something that might look kind of like a spade sign, but is not really a spade sign. So first of all, the structure is too superficial. It's not particularly balloon or spade shaped, but you know that, that's pretty nuanced. So I wouldn't be too strict about that, but the cyst content is that of an epidermal inclusion cyst. It's very loose throughout. We don't have the compact eosinophilic uh, content. And then we can see that the granular layer is a bit more prominent throughout most of the lining of this structure. So this is not the spade sign just a higher magnification of the same. Similarly, these follicular structures are a little bit too dilated, a little bit too superficial. And although the content is eosinophilic, it's completely surrounded by a granular layer. And the degree of eosinophilia is pretty much identical to the compact orthokeratosis in the stratum corneum, suggesting a link to epidermal keratinization rather than the more trichelemal or isthmic type keratinization expected in the spade sign. And so by now you may know that this is a relatively easy fake out, much too superficial 
epidermal or infundibular type keratinization, and this is an insect bite reaction with incidental follicular plugging. This table summarizes the results from our series on the spade sign. We found the spade sign in three out of nine or one third of our cases of clinically confirmed acne keloidalis, and this in fact was exactly the prevalence of the spade sign in the original Taiwan study, with two of those same cases additionally showing the balloon sign. And we did not see any examples of these structures in our clinically confirmed biopsies of folliculitis to calvans, LPP, CCCA, frontal fibrosing alopecia, and one case each of DLE and traction alopecia. This QR code will take you to the reference in PubMed, if interested. Okay, let's move on to the next sign. And the diagnosis is, I would suspect that the clinical pathologic correlation here is maybe more confirmatory than necessary. And by the way, this is the only sign in this talk that was elevated to the level of being mentioned in dermatology world thanks to the recognition by Dr. Rose Alanitsis of the University of Pennsylvania, a regular contributor. And this really indeed, this March 2019 issue seems to be quite seminal because there's also a feature on the derm path appropriate use criteria, which I'll be speaking to the residents about later this morning. The line sign is highly characteristic of morphia and defined by the presence of a prominent and straight demarcation between the deep dermis and subcutis. In contrast, normal skin shows a demarcation, but the collagen fibers are less compact and the subcutaneous fat lobules more rounded in shape. So with the sclerosis centered in the deep dermis, as it stereotypically is in classic morphia, there's an expansion of the collagen and a compression and more prominent straight demarcation of that junction forming the line. Again, it's appropriate to take a step back and don't, don't focus too much on single histopathologic attributes. So we have plenty of clues at low magnification to diagnose morphia. The line sign is just another one of them. So uh, high eccrine glands or superficially displaced eccrine glands are characteristic. Again, the eccrine glands are normally present a little bit deeper and with the increased collagen, they get displaced upwards. And then the sclerosis manifests in various ways. So I think the square biopsy sign is probably the most popular where the uh, punch biopsies have a little bit more of a squared off profile, but truth be told, they're never ever perfectly square. Uh, the cookie cutter sign was what I learned as a resident. So this is refers to the straight parallel edges of the punch biopsy. And so it's really just kind of a variation on the square biopsy sign in my estimation. And then the line sign is the relatively straight prominent demarcation at the junction of dermis and subcutis. And so I think any and all of these work. Here's an example of a punch biopsy. It's not particularly square. It does not have particularly straight or parallel edges, but we can see the prominent demarcation in various aspects of the dermal subcutaneous junction. And so one of the advantages of the line sign is that it does not depend on the procedure type. It doesn't have to be a punch biopsy. It could be a shave biopsy, but it does need to be deep enough to show subcutis. Another example. And another. This one I think is a bit weaker on the line, maybe right here maybe a bit stronger on the cookie cutter and the square for this case. In our little study, we looked at both sensitivity in table one and specificity, and the line sign was fairly sensitive, 82% sensitive, almost as good as the 86% sensitivity of superficial eccrine displacement, but under specificity, not as impressive. So the line sign was only 27% specific. And the main weakness here is that 12 of our cases, we could not even assess the line sign. And the reason was that the biopsies were not deep enough to demonstrate the junction of dermis and subcutis. And as is so often the case in my experience, the observation and the term, the line sign, was coined by one of our 
former dermatology residents, Dr. Michelle Drasnan, and this QR code will take you to this publication if interested. Okay, I've got one more sign for you. Here's one image. What is your diagnosis? In this case, taking a step back might be helpful. And so if this case looks familiar, I suspect you'd be right. This is another example of morphia. And so we can see somewhat of a cookie cutter and square biopsy sign. We have the line sign. But now I'm drawing your attention to some of these collagen fibers. They stand out a little bit to me, at least to my colleagues and I. So this is something that we have designated the free sign as yet another clue for the diagnosis of morphia and other sclerosing disorders. And in contrast to the line sign, which is something assessed at 2x, you know, at the panoramic view, this is more of a medium to high magnification feature. And we can see in various areas of morphia with varying degrees of inflammation, these collagen fibers that kind of stand out from those surrounding them in more than one way. So they're a little bit thicker, they're a little bit more intensely eosinophilic, a little bit darker, and they have an exaggerated retraction or clearing around them compared to the surrounding background collagen fibers. And there is inflammation in the vicinity, but they're not centered directly on or around the collagen fibers of interest. In our estimation, the closest histopathologic feature already described in the literature is the floating sign, which was recently described in morphia and other sclerosing disorders. And in contrast to the what we designate the free sign, the floating sign is a similar collagen fiber that stands out in its exaggerated retraction artifact around it. But in contrast, it's also surrounded by histiocytes, sometimes forming a pseudo rosette or palisaded pattern. Although in the second of the two cases in their series, the histiocytes surrounding the affected collagen were rather sparse, but the histiocytes were considered to be a characteristic and essential feature of the floating sign. Moreover, the floating sign has been more highly associated in the, in the literature with a different disorder, interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, again with histiocytes forming a pseudo rosette or palisaded pattern around the affected collagen fibers, as shown here in this case from the series by Peroni and colleagues. And the term free floating sign has also been used, but to, to my, in my estimation, this is essentially the same thing as the floating sign here in this series of Borrelial associated interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. There's the emphasis on the histiocytic pseudo rosettes and in the images in this publication, we see the free floating collagen. And interestingly to me, I don't actually see really overt palisading or pseudo rosettes, but there certainly are a lot of large mononuclear cells consistent with histiocytes surrounding these free collagen fibers. Shown here in higher magnification and in the publication proven to be histiocytic by immunohistochemistry. And the final variation on this sign, to my knowledge, is the free-floating sign of interstitial mycosis fungoides. So in the image depicted here by Reggiani and co-workers, we can see some clearing around collagen fibers, although I don't see any one in particular that seems to stand out. And the surrounding cells are lymphocytes rather than histiocytes. Our analysis of the free sign was presented as a poster at last year's virtual ASDP meeting. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sarah Yang, who was a medical student at the time that she first observed these collagen fibers and asked about their potential significance. And the result was this study. And so this is not peer reviewed yet, at least not beyond the continuing education and research committee for the ASDP selecting the posters. But we did find that the free sign was present in most cases of morphia, but also present in a number of cases of necrobiosis lipoidica, and even some cases of sclerodermoid graft versus host disease. So similar to other clues for sclerosing disorders, they're really, in a way, surrogate markers for sclerosis and not 
specific for a diagnosis, but since morphia is the most commonly encountered, there is a high association. I'd now like to talk a little bit about the no eosinophils rule in interface dermatitis, but of course that was never part of my own training. I was raised with the Ackerman pattern method where interface dermatitis was divided into vacuolar and lichenoid patterns with corresponding differential diagnoses. And during residency, I also learned from Dr. Philip Lebois how to further subclassify interface dermatitis based on epidermal changes in addition to the pattern of inflammatory cells. But returning to the inflammatory cells, it seemed that there was disproportionately little attention paid to the nature of the cells. Of course, we assume that lymphocytes are present, and we know that a minority of histiocytes are typically present as well, hence the term lymphohistiocytic to commonly describe nonspecific perivascular and interstitial dermal inflammation. And then when histiocytes become more prominent, at some point we can call it granulomatous. And then we typically notice when neutrophils, eosinophils, and plasma cells are present. And so the no eosinophils rule refers to the absence of eosinophils in certain forms of interface dermatitis. Firstly, pityriasis lichenoides, which includes both the acute pleva and pityriasis lichenoides chronica. And secondarily, lupus and dermatomyositis, although there are multiple notable exceptions in this area which will be discussed. While I do credit my dermatopathology attendings at UCSF during my dermatology residency for turning me on to looking into this, when one looked for evidence in the published literature or textbooks, there really wasn't much. So I think the no eosinophils rule holds up best for pityriasis lichenoides. So here is a summary of many, if not most, major textbooks in dermatopathology and the English language, and the vast, vast majority do not mention the tendency for pityriasis lichenoides to lack eosinophils. And a cumulative review of case reports spanning decades of pityriasis lichenoides, including atypical and febrile ulceronecrotic variants of pityriasis lichenoides, we find a similar result. Only rare reports of eosinophils exceptionally present in pityriasis lichenoides. And similar to the textbook review, it's worth noting that it's not that the eosinophils were absent, it's just simply not mentioned. So the eosinophils are just completely off the radar to the observer. So over my years in practice, I've gradually gotten accustomed to routinely looking for the status of eosinophils anytime I see interface dermatitis. To the extent that I might even notice their absence as quickly as I would notice my daughter's eye missing. In our study, we divided various forms of interface dermatitis into two groups. So group one was the no eosinophils group, that was our hypothesis, and group two were all others. And we created an eosinophil count, which we defined as the number of eosinophils in 10 representative fields at medium magnification, the 20x objective or 200 times magnification. And so we looked at different forms of lupus, dermatomyositis, Graft versus host disease is known for showing no eosinophils, and so we put that in there, even though it wasn't part of our original hypothesis. And then we have pityriasis lichenoides. And so we can see overall that the average eosinophil count in the no eosinophils disorders was low, 0.4, with among the lowest being pityriasis lichenoides and dermatomyositis and tumid lupus. But low numbers of cases there. And we can see that with discoid lupus, it was also similarly low. And we took that data and created a receiver operator characteristic curve, followed by identification of the cutoff criteria for maximizing the distinction between the group one and group two disorders. And the correct classification was maximized at 81% using a cutoff of 1.1. And here's a summary of the definition and findings. And of course, in order to make this information more likely to be actually used in clinical practice, it needs to be simple, simple, simple. So the way I look at this data is I take that 1.1, I did just round it off to about one, 
which then means that if you see one eosinophil within 10 20x fields, then eosinophils are not rare or absent. In other words, you have a group 2 disorder, not a group 1 disorder. And then, of course, taking a step back, it's important to recognize that as good as this may be, 81% correct classification as a single histologic attribute, it's just one of many factors considered in the overall composite histopathologic, histopathologic assessment of a case. And then, of course, you have your clinical correlation. But I think it's not bad, especially as a free test. And here the QR code will take you to this reference if interested. And again, taking a step back, we've been focusing on one inflammatory cell, the eosinophil, but in the overall context, we would look at the pattern of the inflammation, associated epidermal changes, and other features here that may be helpful for the diagnosis of pityriasis lichenoides. And I think, to my knowledge, this rule has held up pretty well for pityriasis lichenoides. There was a recent series from Sylvie Freitag, pediatric dermatopathologist and colleagues in Paris, and they did a comprehensive series of pityriasis lichenoides, and they actively looked for eosinophils in their cases, and they did not find any. But as I mentioned, when we get to lupus and dermatomyositis, there are some notable exceptions. So I do occasionally see sometimes more than a few eosinophils in lupus, and that doesn't really give me as much pause as it would for pityriasis lichenoides. And so there are some exceptions, as I mentioned. So I think that the scalp, it's not been studied rigorously to my knowledge, but I think uh, I don't really apply the no eosinophils rule to discoid lupus on the scalp. And then it's also fairly well known that eosinophils are quite acceptable for lupus profundus or lupus paniculitis. So those would be two exceptions for the no eosinophils rule in lupus. And I think this notion of the scalp being an exception to the no eosinophils rule was supported by this study by Maria Meteva and colleagues looking at a large series of dermatomyositis with scalp involvement. And they, in fact, looked for eosinophils and found them in about a fifth of their cases. And for my last topic, I don't mind if I startle you a little bit. I need to keep you awake towards the end of the hour and also at the dreaded risk of unintentionally offending anybody's religious sensitivities. But I myself happen to have been raised in a Baptist church in the Chinese American community in Sacramento. And there I was taught that in the first book of Moses or Genesis chapter one, verse one, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the only reason I would submit this is relevant is that much later on as a professional, I learned that DermPath created dermal hypersensitivity reactions, DHR. And part of the evidence for this dermal hypersensitivity, DHR, being a DermPath creation is that if you look in most of the major dermatology textbooks, you will not find that phrase anywhere in any of the textbooks. And it turns out that the vast majority of dermatopathology textbooks don't mention it either. But it's been my experience that what one can find in the published literature and textbooks is really just the tip of the iceberg for what clinicians are experiencing in daily practice. This textbook has been provided for many years to our incoming residents. And in the introductory chapter, it does mention the presence of eosinophils in a dermal hypersensitivity response. But to the best of my knowledge, the purpose of this image was to show what eosinophils look like, and the phrase dermal hypersensitivity is not mentioned anywhere else in the rest of the textbook. But the dermal hypersensitivity reaction has been, at least on my radar, for about 20 years. Here are a couple of self-assessment exam questions from the American Society of Dermatopathology in 2001, and we can see that a couple of questions have dermal hypersensitivity reaction as a choice. But for those who are into creating multiple choice tests, you may notice that it's the last choice on both and the choices are not in alphabetical order. So it's kind of just sitting there as an obvious distractor, not, not gonna be the right answer. Actually, more like 25 years, a quarter century, since I was first introduced to this term by my fellowship director, the late Dr. Scott McNutt, and shown here is an example of one of his reports from Cornell 
Medical Center at that time. And shown here on the right are the histopathologic features. They're inherently nonspecific, perivascular and slightly interstitial dermatitis with mostly lymphocytes and scattered eosinophils and minimal to absent epidermal changes. This image might not be representative, but in Dr. McNutt's report, he noted the presence of slight spongiosis and suggested the possibility of allergic contact dermatitis. And then because of the deep inflammation, most spongiotic dermatitis has dermal inflammation extending usually into the superficial dermis only. In this case, because of the deep inflammation, which is characteristic of a DHR, an internal antigen source seems likely. And to me, that's a, another way of describing drug reaction. My first real job after fellowship was as an assistant professor of dermatology at the University of Connecticut. And so having come from Cornell, it didn't seem unusual at all to me that pathology reports were being issued with a diagnosis of dermal hypersensitivity reaction. But also of note here is that in this skin biopsy submitted from another one of my colleagues, the late Dr. Karen Grin, the clinical information was rule out dermal hypersensitivity reaction. So I couldn't help but wonder where did all this come from? And so for my personal training, it started with Dr. McNutt at Cornell, but I asked him where he got that phrase from. And he said he learned it when he was at UCSF. And you know, I was a resident at UCSF. I never heard that phrase from Phil LeBois or Timothy McCalmont, who were the two attendings at that time. And so digging just a little bit deeper, I learned that it was the predecessor to my residency attendings, Dr. Richard Sagabiel, a pathologist, dermatopathologist. And so this was a long time ago. I just called him up on the phone and spoke to him on a landline. And he told me that he made this phrase up. He was seeing this pattern and he didn't know what it represented. And he thought it would be good to have kind of a hashtag, if you will, uh, for the, a dermal hypersensitivity reaction in case he wanted to go back or someone wanted to go back and study these cases at some point in the future. And that's how the phrase arose. There may be other sources, but this is the one that I've learned firsthand. Returning then to my day job at UConn, I was further intrigued by the fact that the clinicians were starting to submit biopsies with a rule out DHR. And so to me, this seemed to be somewhat of a distortion or warp, warping of what I learned in medical school. Uh, I don't know about everybody here, but I was taught that usually you start with a history and then do a physical exam. And then only in a fairly small subset of cases is a biopsy needed. Whereas in the DHR world, it seemed that the cycle of healthcare and evaluation starts with the biopsy which being rendered as a dermal hypersensitivity reaction is not the language of clinical dermatology or medicine. And so the clinician then has to go back and look at the history and exam and try to reconcile those biopsy findings with what's actually on the patient. And it does turn out that with careful clinical pathologic correlation on a case-by-case -case basis, one can make more specific diagnoses for at least some of these patients. But first, let's just take one more look at the classic histology of the dermal hypersensitivity reaction. If there's a clinical prototype, it might be a patient with itchy red bumps as depicted here on the torso. But histologically, the dermal hypersensitivity reaction is defined by a superficial and mid perivascular and interstitial lymphocytic dermatitis, scattered eosinophils, and minimal to absent epidermal changes. With such nonspecific findings, it's generally prudent to consider getting deeper sections. And also at higher magnification, one can often appreciate minimal epidermal spongiosis. And a minority of scattered dermal eosinophils amidst the lymphocytes. The additional presence of dermal neutrophils being a more variable and not required finding. Although a substantial subset of these patients show urticarial lesions clinically, in contrast to classic urticaria, excoriation and resulting hemorrhagic crust is not infrequent, and that is reflected by the presence of 
foci of crust, ulceration, or confluent epidermal necrosis seen microscopically. And since 1997 and for approximately 20 years thereafter, Dr. David Whedon's skin pathology textbook was the only Dermpath textbook that mentioned dermal hypersensitivity at all. And in a short paragraph, he described some of its features, as I've mentioned, lymphocytes and eosinophils, superficial and mid-dermal extension. And following the theme of itchy red bumps, some resemblance to the picture seen in an arthropod bite reaction, but the infiltrate not usually as heavy and does not extend as deeply in the dermis. Of course, no references. And in subsequent editions through 2016, Dr. Whedon stated that dermal hypersensitivity was the most controversial concept in dermatopathology for many reasons, including inconsistent usage, variable clinical path correlations, its enigmatic nature, and parenthetically, last but not least, the emotive climate that accompanies the use of the term. Other leading scholars like Dr. Philip Lebois weighed in, referring to the dermal hypersensitivity reaction as the last refuge of dermatopathology scoundrels. And at a recent annual ASDP meeting, in response to this audience response question, this expert panel member stated, I hate the term DHR. And so in a most unemotional and most reductionistic manner, I sought to establish clinical pathologic correlations for the DHR reaction. And the results of my clinical pathologic correlations in this initial series from the University of Connecticut is listed as follows. So we can see that drug reactions, idiopathic urticaria, and various forms of eczematous dermatitis, often with urticarial features, were the top three, followed by arthropod bite reactions. And the QR code here in the lower right will take you to this publication if interested. There were a few relatively obscure disorders that seemed to fit under the DHR umbrella. One of these was the late A. Bernard Ackerman's itchy red bump disease described in his 1978 seminal gold book on dermatopathology describing this condition as being similar to arthropod bite reactions, but clinically not compatible with that diagnosis, and histologically similar findings to DHR with superficial and mid-inflammation and eosinophils. Interestingly, this is the only textbook where a section on this disorder appears. It did not appear in any of Ackerman's subsequent writings or any other textbooks, to my knowledge. But Dr. Joseph Urizzo and colleagues subsequently advanced the field into the realm of much needed management, here including itchy red bump disease as well as subacute parigo under the term that they designated papular dermatitis. And in Australia, Dr. Stephen Cosard and colleagues introduced the term urticarial dermatitis into the literature. So they regarded urticarial dermatitis as a subset of the DHR pattern. So the biopsies show the findings as I've shown, but there's a broader clinical spectrum. The patients might have itchy red bumps, but they could also have itchy urticarial plaques or some combination of different morphologies. And I also came to realize that back in my residency days at UCSF, the phrase being used was urticarial hypersensitivity reaction for patients with itchy red bumps, as well as itchy, variably urticarial plaques, fulfilling the clinical pathologic criteria for classification as urticarial dermatitis, if idiopathic. And more recently, Hannon and colleagues from the Mayo Clinic published a large series of urticarial dermatitis showing the histologic features of the dermal hypersensitivity reaction. And while overall, I think now the largest body of literature, however small, now exists for urticarial dermatitis, in my own anecdotal practice, I still see the DHR being submitted as a clinical diagnosis repeatedly. And so what follows is just a series of pathology requisitions, giving you a sense of what's in the clinical differential with DHR for various patients, starting from 2017.
continuing on into the pandemic. through to 2022. And late last year, my colleague Jeff Wu and I published a chapter on dermal hypersensitivity in pathology outlines that can be reached by scanning this QR code if interested. My colleague Tin Chow and I presented what would be, if published, the largest series on dermal hypersensitivity reactions, also the most ethnically diverse series to be published, perhaps complementing the series from the Mayo Clinic in the Midwest and my Yukon series from the Northeast. And as we look at the final clinical pathologic or composite diagnoses, we see the usual sus suspects, examinus dermatitis NOS, lots of idiopathic cases that defy classification, but then insect bites, urticaria, and we further subclassified some idiopathic itchy red bump disease and urticarial dermatitis. Drug reactions always common, and notably, a small but measurable number of cases fulfilled Hannafin Rajka criteria for atopic dermatitis. And if we look at all of these large series on DHR and urticarial dermatitis, we can now appreciate that we actually have the experience of several hundreds of patients and can confirm that many patients, if not most, have unknown clinical diagnoses, but many also can be classified as urticarial dermatitis, among other disorders such as eczematous and drug. And one clinically relevant observation from this data is that the runners-up in all of these large series included eczematous dermatitis, and a subset of those surely include atopic dermatitis which we all know is the big time in dermatology with millions of emergency department visits alone annually and involving hundreds of millions of healthcare dollars. You don't even have to be a center of excellence in eczema like you are at Mount Sinai to know this. And even tourists randomly wandering through hotel lobbies that are sponsoring AAD meetings might also know this. And so I think it's not surprising that in the last few years, case reports have been emerging of the successful use of dupilumab to treat patients with biopsies showing dermal hypersensitivity reaction. Most recently as a case series of six patients in which patients presented with a variety of chronic treatment refractory disorders improved with dupilumab and flared upon withdrawal of it. From the perspective of pathogenesis, we know that there's no ancillary diagnostic testing required to get approval for dupilumab in atopic dermatitis patients. But in our series of DHR patients conducted by Tin Chow and myself, Tin is, was a medical student at the time. He's now a senior dermatology resident at Brown University, but he developed an immunohistochemical assay for interleukin-4 receptor expression. He also looked at IL-31 as well, but this is the IL-4 receptor expression data in normal skin compared to lesional biopsies of clinically confirmed itchy red bump disease, urticarial dermatitis, and atopic dermatitis. And we can see that there is scattered positivity among what appear to be perivascular lymphocytes in all of the lesional skin. And so that is pretty much a wrap. In summary, we've reviewed a number of free histopathologic clues, and now you should have all the answers. So the free sign and line sign are clues to the presence of morphia or other sclerosing disorders. The spade sign may be pathognomonic for acne keloidalis. Caterpillar bodies are specific for porphyria, and the no eosinophils rule applies to pityriasis lichenoides and to a lesser extent graft versus host disease and lupus or dermatomyositis with various exceptions as noted. And lastly, hopefully you have a better understanding of the DHR, dermal hypersensitivity reaction pattern and its relationship to conventional inflammatory disorders, specifically its relationship to atopic eczematous dermatitis with the TH2 spectrum and now emerging 
data showing that dupilumab is a viable treatment option for this very poorly characterized and refractory group of patients. And thank you very much again so much for this opportunity.